Experience. Did they have a head engineer at that ASI? Is that what it was called? It was the owner, and he, he just decided he didn't want to do it anymore. Oh, nice. He was more comfortable swindling people in the front office. So I, I did get to do a lot of groups there, and uh, since we were in North Minneapolis, I did a lot of R&B groups. As a matter of fact, that's when I first met Prince. Um, this developer I know, Archie Gibbons, he brought in a group called Champagne. Yeah. And it was, no, it was Grand Central. Grand right? Central, yeah. yeah. It was Prince and Andre Simone and Morris Day, a, tri a trio. And um, I recorded them, and, you know, I don't think it was anything special. I can't remember what it was, but about a year later, Prince broke off from that group. and They come in as Grand Central, Andre you know, housed Prince when he got kicked out at 14 years old. What did they record? Was it like they a funk had song? songs? Yeah, they had songs they had written. I mean, for the life of me, I can't remember. I guess I would have if they would have been. But we were all amateur back then. It yeah. was just the beginning, the beginning of the sound of Minneapolis. And it was the beginning of professionalism in Minneapolis. Morris is playing drums. Morris Prince is, is playing singing. drums. Andre was playing bass and Prince played guitar. And then a couple tracks, they were doing a demo. Yeah, it was a demo, a couple tracks, uh, you know, and Archie was kind of a, a wealthy developer, and he brought them in. He, he was the one that spotted them. And, um, you know, it was uh, beginnings. Yeah. Was was, did you notice a Prince had just an amazing talent then? Not at that time. Okay. No. How long was it till he came back in and did the demo It was by a himself? year later that... Um, Owen Husney took advantage of, he took over Prince's management and brought him to me. Yeah. I was at a different studio at the, after that. and um, A better one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had counters on the tape machine. <laughs> what was the Minneapolis sound at the time? There was no Minneapolis sound at the time. It was um, shallow recordings and it was drifting around. Nobody, there was no sound. I mean... Bob Dylan was the closest thing to. Wow. It was folk blues, is what it was. I and mean, Kerner Ray and Glover and Bob Dylan, and uh, it was the folk blues. Uh, that was what was big back there. And it's still considered a contributing factor to all the R&B that came out of there. So Prince comes back in and. Did he request you, or did you know uh, you knew his manager? I don't know what happened, but I was probably the one of the only engineers that knew the street and knew what was going on, and I wasn't doing television commercials like everybody else, um, which that's that's all they did. Yeah, that but, was so much work in here. I mean, there was three sessions a day. Was there three sessions in the eighties when you were here? Two. Oh, yeah. It went down yeah. to two. Yeah, you don't well, get a no, lot. It was, it was a double session, so it was a, a daytime and a, and a night. So didn't he, Prince, he does this demo, and do you remember what the song was? Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. It was, he, he had all these new songs written that were great, and he had recorded every part on this little hand cassette machine. Yeah. And he recorded, he hummed the piano part, and then he hummed the drum beat, and then he hummed the guitar part, and... We'd go around the room, and every before he started the drums, he'd listen to the drum part. Same thing with the piano, same thing with the bass. And he had planned it out, uh, and he was able to execute it all himself, which is really rare to be that objective over your own playing and not sound like it's one guy. He didn't, didn't sound like it was one guy. It was, he managed to put different personalities on different instruments. And that was what I thought was so amazing about him is that he could just pick up anything and uh, yeah, and he didn't have to talk to anybody. It was no. all in his head, and he just you know he was all by himself. He loved that. So yeah, I mean he got so comfortable with uh, recording that he did a lot of it himself eventually. Yeah, with uh, Peggy teaching him how to do a lot of things himself. Yeah, he tortured a lot of people too. But. <laughs> Why did? Um, so he, why did he split with Grand Central? Do they want to? Because he wanted to do his own thing. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, I was friends with Andre during that whole time, and Andre wanted to break off and do his own thing. Everyone wanted to do their own thing at the time. And, you know, Prince, Prince through Owen and my cousin Cliff, got, got a chance at Warner Brothers because uh, Cliff was the promotion man for Warner Brothers. And they took the tape to Russ Dyrat there, and he flipped out. He couldn't believe it was one guy. And uh, so they f they flew us out here, and they were in the studio. I, I think it was it was that wooden studio of Warner Brothers in the Valley. I forgot. Amigo. The name. Yeah. That's where they went. Amigo. What? Amigo. Yeah, Amigo. Right. Yeah. And uh, they had uh, Lenny Lenny uh, Warnaker Warnaker there, and Gary Katz, and um, Ted Templeman. And they had a all their famous producers came yeah. into the room wow. to, to see if Prince could actually do it himself. And we started working, and he got 90% done with one song. And you were there, too? Yeah. So yeah. you flew out from Minneapolis Yeah. because on uh, Prince's request? Well, I was, that, I was his guy. Yeah, you were doing his stuff back in Minneapolis, yeah. and he said, come out with me, I'm going to go do this right. work. And they Yeah, I never you. worked for him. I just worked along with him. Yeah. Which is great because I, I didn't have to get the calls at four in the morning, <laughs> like Peggy did. No, I didn't work for him either. I worked for the studio. So oh, that's right. So they you, would call me. He you weren't on his yeah. payroll, but the, yeah, he was, wasn't on his payroll. Yeah, Susan lucky. was though. Susan was. She was. Yeah, he could be very hard on people, and especially you know when he had the eye of Soren that oh, he, yeah. he'd focus on some person that he didn't think was doing a job and. He'd let him have it. I, I had one day like that. Yeah. Well, one day you're... Yeah, only one. That's only good. one where he really focused and, uh, yeah, yeah, he was riding me all day long. Oh. It was rough. When the tape got lost or whatever? Yeah, and it, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with me. That's what was so irritating. David lost it, didn't he, or something? Oh, I don't know who lost it. Okay. I don't know who he lost it. He was a very it. tough boss. I mean, I didn't, I didn't come under his wrath at all, so I'm... Luckily, a witness to that, but I've seen him when he had assistant engineers, especially, oh, yeah. he'd come down on them and say, What are you doing? And they had to explain themselves. You know, it was almost like they were sweating and shaking. And he liked that too. Yeah, he liked that. He'd, <laughs> he'd like to keep people under his thumb. But he demanded greatness from everybody. Do you think that's kind of what his attitude was, or who, was he just kind of venting out on people? No, he wasn't just venting, he was trying to, it was a control thing. Yeah. He knew trying it was to best. control people that, you, you know, keep them under your influence. I mean, don't tell them things. Let them guess. And that, he used to treat his band that way. You come out to Amigo with him, with the new manager. Everybody at Warner Brothers is excited. You guys go on Amigo. He plays every single instrument. Yeah. He's a phenom. They had already signed him at that point? They had already signed him, but they were trying to figure out who was going to produce him. That's what they had all those oh, wow. guys in there. Mm -hmm. 